I want to thank you for joining us. This is Whistlekick Live. This is the 11th monthly installment. This is a thing we've been doing for nearly a year. Wow. Uh, I want to give a huge special thank you shout out to Gabe Sue, who is behind the scenes. If, if we were in some fancy TV studio, this is where a cameraman would, would turn the camera and you would see him, but you can't because he's on the other side of the country. And he is remoted in, and he's doing all sorts of things. I can see him. He's right there. You can't see him, but I can. Trust me, he's doing, he's, he just waved to me. They can't see you wave, Gabe. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he's the reason that this show is not lame. So, uh, thank you. Thank you to Gabe. Well, we've got some good stuff in store for you. I don't know why I didn't shut the door in here. You're probably going to see an appearance by the cat at some point. So I guess we'll just leave it open and see what happens. If she gets particularly annoying, I may get up and uh, shut that door. But thanks for joining us. We've got some people in the chat. They're saying things, saying hello, talking to each other. We encourage that. You know, why do we do this show? Because we're just trying to collect everyone together once a month in the same figurative place at the same, hopefully literal time so we can talk and celebrate martial arts and everything that's going on. So we got some great stuff involved. And first topic, if you want to throw that up, Gabe, everybody can see how much of our training should be focused on our own benefit and protection and how much should be focused on the protection of others. Now, what's really, really ironic about this question, and I'm not going to go deeper, but the episode for this coming Monday talks about this. The guest that we had on brought this up. We talked about a bunch of it, uh, stuff that I have never seen, heard, discussed before. So to answer that question, how much of it should in, can you throw that back? I want to make sure I'm reading it right. I know I just totally messed it up for you. No. <laughs> how much of our training should we focus on our own benefit? How much should we focus on the protection of others? All right. Uh, you can, you can. Hey, thanks. Even better. Uh, I think the majority should be on our, on ourselves. I do. And I don't say that in a selfish way. I, I say it for a couple of reasons, two reasons. One, uh, it's the whole cliche. You got to put it in your oxygen mask before you help other people. If you get seriously hurt, if you die, if you, any of those things, what are you going to do? How are you going to help anyone else? That's number one. Number two, it's really... Whew, the odds the start. They shouldn't be starting because I'm talking a lot. My body's saying, I need oxygen. If you're training for other people, if you're training to protect other people solely, that's really hard to do. It's really challenging. And while there's absolutely value there, that's absolutely, absolutely should be part of it. I want you to run through some scenarios where you've got other people that you're trying to protect. It's not that simple. So is it relevant? Yes. Is it important? Yes. Is it an advanced subject? Absolutely. Hey, look at all these people joining in. Tons of them. Gabe is a ninja then. Yes, without a doubt. Oh, we're, we're missing these buttons. Craig's on the line coming in from his phone. We got Craig, we got Jordan, we got Andrea, we got Eric, we got Hannah, we got Jeremiah, and we got other people. We got Jordan, we got Jason, we got Andrew. It's just, it's a party. It's great. All right, what was that next one? Mm. And Matt had a response. Love the question. You can't protect anyone else without being able to protect yourself. I said that. Didn't I say that? But there should be some balance between the two. I agree. I agree. And if you want to know what I'm drinking, it's once again, Spindrift, not sponsoring the show. If anybody knows anybody at Spindrift, I would love to be sponsored by Spindrift. It's probably the only food and beverage endorsement I would accept because uh, it's really tasty and the only thing more healthy is plain water. And uh, I drink a lot of it. So even if they just sent me a couple cases a month, I would talk more about them. If you know anybody at Spindrift, Spindrift, get at me. <laughs> This is funny, but it's also real. 
you know you're a martial artist if your significant other always gives you the seat with your back to the wall. I've had people rush to take the seat next to the wall just to give me a hard time. And I've had a conversation with them. Are you going to be observing all the exits and the people that come in and out and, and monitoring to see who is a threat and who is not? No? Then move. <laughs> it's a responsibility. Having that knowledge, having the, 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 let's face it, the power, the skill that we have as martial artists comes with a responsibility. What's that Spider-Man quote? With great responsibility, with great power comes great responsibility. That's us. Maybe it's not always great, but it's there. It's real. And if you're not going to use it for good, should you be using it? That ties in with the question. What's your favorite weapon to train? What about to watch? Hmm. Now, growing up, we started off with bow. And I became, I'm going to say mildly proficient at bow. And at the time I was competing and I might be in a ring with 12 other people and 10 of them would be using bow, two of them would be using comma. And this was the nineties. So it was flying comma. So you had that strings and people spin in the comma with the strings. And I wasn't going to use comma, but you know who my favorite Ninja Turtle was? It was Raphael. And on my, 13th birthday my, at my bar mitzvah I was gifted a pair of sai by my instructors and I started training and started competing I, I adapted MP the kata MP with sai and I think it came out pretty good I, I competed well with it as recently as 10 years ago and so I would say that that was probably my favorite weapon. I competed with sword after that. And I, I, I know the basics of a number of other weapons, but what was great about Psy was it built your forearms. Just flipping that thing out and flipping it back. Oh, look at, look at that camera. Oh, I wish I had a pair of Psy right here. I would possibly hit the camera with them. But uh, I would say those are, those are my favorite. Matt says to train forms. I love nunchucks with a partner Tonfa. I love watching sword work. It can be so pretty to watch if done right. I would agree watching sword is probably the best because there, anybody who's picked up a sword and really tried to use it, tried to use it in mock combat, uh, tried to use it in cutting anything, knows how challenging it can be. Uh, Andrew also says, Sai. Jason wants to learn the Naginata. Andrew hates bow, though he recognizes the benefit to its usefulness. Jason's current favorite is either the broadsword or the spear. Right on. You can tell a little bit about what people train based on their answers. You know, you're a martial artist when people make Bruce Lee noises at you. I can't tell you how many times this has happened to me. I'm sure if you've been training a while, it's probably happened to you. Somehow I drank that wrong. Hold on. One of the advantages to this headset, I know the audio quality isn't as good, but I've got this, this fancy mute button, which is nice when you're going live. So I can mute myself. Um, you know what's fun? Put that put that back up for a moment, Gabe. Take a look at the, the black and the yellow. Yeah, I'm, dri I'm driving him nuts, asking him to go back and forth. So you got black and yellow, and then look at what else I got. <laughs> it's, it's Funko Pop. Scorpion, a.k.a. Chris Casamasa, a.k.a. episode 216. Shihan, Chris Casamasa. Great guy. Uh, when I, when Amazon was like, hey, do you want this? And I said, yes, I do. I think this was like $7. How great is this? And I was telling Gabe before the show that um, I don't have a very big uh, um, bucket list. The, the major item has already been checked off. I wanted to go to the Galapagos Islands, and I did that. Uh, seven years ago, I was there right now, but apparently now one of them is, I want a Funko of me. 
I think I need to do some important things before that's going to happen. Context on that. Bruce Lee often wore tracksuits in his movies, like the famous yellow and black one from Game of Death, in order to promote his idea of the style of no style, just like his be like water quote. I find it a bit ironic that people want to identify so much with that yellow suit when he intended it to be nondescript. Yeah, that's that's an important point. When was the last time you saw Bruce Lee in anything approaching a, an official official martial arts uniform? I think that's pretty cool. Whew. Jared responds, Bruce, uh, Monty Python wanted to make their flying circus so show so unusual and non sequitur that it had no discernible pattern. However, Python-esque is now a word in the Oxford English Dictionary. So, in some ways, they totally failed. <laughs> Gabe asks, Jared, do you think it's possible to not have a style or is it theoretical? Jared responds, there are two parts to Bruce Lee's philosophy of no style. The first is that styles, by their nature, are limiting. He's right about that. Even as Jeet Kune Do had limitations involved in it, as it should. The idea of human physical conflict is too large a subject to learn. Styles are designed to isolate Ooh. and look at this subject from one perspective. The second part is this. When you look at an actual fight, there is no style involved. So why trade in a style? Again, the idea of style is a learning tool, not a result. So it is impossible to have no style. Bruce just didn't want someone to be locked into someone else's style. Each human should make their own style. And that, unsurprising to me that, that Sensei Jared Wilson and I would agree so strongly on something. Great guy, great friend. I wonder if he's in the chat. You in there, Jared? I don't know if he's in here. I don't know. Can't tell, but he usually pops by at some point. And I agree, styles are limiting. However, if you look at style as in artistic expression, as a body of work, and this is where I think there's value in style actually being constricted and trying to simplify it down to the point of elegance. I think there's something really nice in there. If I was to develop a style, it wouldn't have anything and everything as a lot of people do. It would have a handful of forms, maybe four to five kicks, four to five punches, four to five blocks. That'd be it. And from there it becomes free form. Maybe. Maybe you have some, some structured stuff in between basic techniques and forms. Maybe there's some organized keyhone. I don't know. I don't know. I have no plans to develop my own style, so I haven't thought about it that much. What's the craziest thing you've seen happen at a tournament? Jenny says, I once saw a guy's windpipe collapsed by a jump spinning back kick. Three paramedics rushed over and performed a tracheotomy, then rushed him to the hospital. We heard a couple weeks later that he was all right. Um, well, let's see. What have I seen? I've seen plenty of blood. I've seen a couple people knocked out. I think craziest, if we're really going to talk craziest, I've seen, I've almost seen a few fights from people not involved in the tournament. I was almost in a fight with a student's instructor because he didn't like my score. Um, I think it was a tournament last fall, I saw somebody almost get in a fight with, it was, it was the center referee, and one of the, one of the fighters had a, had a group of friends there, and they didn't like how things went, and so there was this half a dozen people that were basically threatening the center referee. And I got involved a little bit and I got some other people to get involved and just, it was, it was, it was messy. Uh, fortunately nothing happened, but it was not pleasant to be part of. 
Gabe's writing in, I saw two moms get in a fight over their kids in a sparring match. It's funny because it's ridiculous. It's I'm not I'm not laughing because it's something that should be endorsed. The kids were under ten, of course they were. Of what? Why? I think so often the people who need to learn the lessons of martial arts are the parents of small children. Absolutely ridiculous. Andrew says Jenny wins. I don't know. Jason says, I saw a mom changing her child's belt between divisions. I asked her what she was doing. She said, oh, my son is only a green belt in this division and a yellow belt in this one. Hmm. I didn't know it worked that way. This is a sad but very good question. If you could go back in time to the last martial arts class you attended before the shutdown, what would you say to yourself would you change anything about that class? Hmm. I would say, hey, get your time's worth out of this because it's going to be a little while. Would I change anything? Might have lingered a bit longer. <laughs> Might have said, hey, can we do another few minutes? Um, I have not been back in a formal class since... March. And it makes me sad. I don't know about you guys. But I miss it. I'm missing it. Mm. In case you're wondering, I look over here. I've got the Facebook chat on a separate computer. So just looking to see what else people are writing in. Let's get philosophical for a minute. How does your favorite form technique or oh, aspect of the martial arts reflect who you are. Ooh. All right. I can do this. I can get there. Martial arts is personal growth. It is also artistic expression. Thus, at different stages of life, based on how you're feeling, who you are, what you're in need of you are likely to find yourself resonating with different things. I have found that at different times in my life, I've preferred different techniques. I've preferred different forms. I have found value in certain things. For example, I grew up with two instructors who had two different sets of forms. I prefer, greatly preferred one set of forms to the other because one of them, the one I didn't like, required far more nuance. It was less dramatic. It wasn't as good in competition overall. Ironically, two of the three forms that I spent much time with in competition came from that set, but I adapted them a bit. Uh, as I've gotten older, I've come to enjoy those forms more, much more, because there's more opportunity for nuance. My ability to express myself as a martial artist through those forms has increased as my understanding has increased. This is an interesting one. I, I'm, I'm curious how you came up with this number. Okay, this is a big number. If you found a gold nugget worth $915 million and had to spend it on martial arts related things, what would you spend it on? And the answers to this, because I think this got posted in the um, Fun and Friends group. Yeah. Um, I would build a giant dojo and tournament venue offering lots of different styles. I would fund a karate research organization, fund books and documentaries on old style karate. I would build the largest multi-level martial arts gym you've ever seen in your life. No school would lack for sponsorships. I would produce my martial art TV show. That's about 32 pounds of gold. I'm thinking kettlebells. Who said that? Who's the nerd that's doing the conversion on that? Because it wasn't me. And you know, the best part is my initial instinct was, oh, that was. And then I realized that I probably know 20 martial arts nerds that are nerdy enough to have done that math. <laughs> that's great. Uh, what would I do? 
what would I do with nine hundred fifty million dollars? If I now the question, big question: Does whistle kick count as martial arts related? If it does, easy. We're buying product. We're developing things. We're running more content. We've got more shows. We've got we've got more, just more. The things that we're doing, we're doing more of them. Now, what if whistle kick doesn't count? If whistle kick doesn't count. Hmm. I'm thinking of a few things. I'm going on tour and I'm teaching seminars for free. And heck, maybe that even counts as whistle kick. Could be a heck of a lot of scholarships. See, the thing is, that's close to a billion dollars. And how you get a billion dollar dojo or training hall is just too big. It's too big. It's too big. Too big. Um, I'd build a large training center, and that might cost five mil. Unless I'm putting in like a big metro area. Uh, Matt says, "Open a school, host an open tournament annually, and help invest it into others who want to open a school but don't have the startup." And lastly, give Jeremy whatever he needed to turn what's okay kick into whatever his end game vision is. Uh, I'm uncomfortable reading the last part. It compliments me very strongly. Um, I'll just do it. He's done more for martial arts artists than I think I ever will. You don't waste good. Thank you, Matt. That means a lot to me. Frank, I would set aside a fund so that I could study as many martial arts as I wanted for as long as I wanted. A nice round figure would be $1 million. The rest... You guys would go to Jeremy so we could build that residential training place he's always wanted to and whistle kick. Smiley face. <laughs> Cave and buy the whistle kick bus. Frank, for $949 million, you could probably have a whistle kick yacht and plane to go with it. Um, yeah, the, the residential school, the college. I think we could probably do that in there. That would be a lot of fun. I hope we can make that work someday. scholarships. <laughs> Jason says tacos to the next martial arts TV show and three Bruce Lee robots. <laughs> Can you imagine an army of Bruce Lee robots? Um, which Iron Man is it? Two? With the the um, hammer industry is the cheap knockoffs but there's a bunch of them and they're autonomous. What if you had a bunch of those that were Bruce Lee? They looked like Bruce Lee. That'd be crazy. A whole bunch of Bruce Lee bots. I'm imagining something a cross between that and uh, whichever Austin Powers it is that has the fembots. How do you define respect in the martial arts and how does it differ from honor? Honor is a code. Honor is internal. Respect is what you do. I didn't expect that to be such a clear definition in my mind. As I was reading it, 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 it just kind of clicked in. Um, in martial arts, we're, we're, whether we realize it or not, we talk a lot about honor. Bushido is a code. Budo, these are codes. These are structures. These are um, laws, in a sense, that we guide ourselves by. Respect is an outward expression at times of that honor. I can show respect to people whether or not it has to do with martial arts. I can also give you circumstances where I can be honorable and not show respect. What if somebody starts a fight with me? I'm not going to bow to them in the middle. They punch me in the face. I'm not going to bow before I defend myself. Bowing would be respectful, but it wouldn't be honorable. The, the code of combat has been... It's been set. Now, after I'm done, hopefully, defending myself, depending on how you view it, maybe I would bow to them or something similar. If I'm kicking them when they're down, that's not honorable, nor is it respectful. I think the two relate pretty, pretty cleanly. Matt says, we define respect as treating others the way you want to be treated. Yes, no, sir, ma'am, looking down as we bow, saluting flags as we enter, exit the training floor, etc. 
In my opinion, honor is more of the title, role, reputation that you've built for yourself and in what you do and stand for. Ah, yes, see, so we agree. What you do and stand for, that's the code. It's that internal piece. Hmm. Internal versus external, I like that. Yeah. This was one I think that we ended up with some some good conversation around. And and just as an aside, if you're not part of the martial arts fun and friends group, you really should be. There's some good stuff that happens over there. It's not it's not constant. It's not too much. Uh, no promotion. In fact, there has never been a whistle kick promotion to the point that people have attempted to share. Not me. Other people have tried to share whistle kick things in there. I am the admin of the group and I have not posted. I've deleted it. That is how committed I am to keeping it commercial free. I won't even let whistle kick stuff come through. What do you think about having martial arts clubs in the workplace? Well, you say martial arts club, Gabe. I'm assuming you don't mean like a stick, like a club. I assume you mean clubs. <laughs> what do you think about having martial arts clubs in the workplace? Uh, I think it's great. I mean, I, I take it back to my feeling that any martial arts is beneficial. Every martial art is beneficial. And the more opportunities for people to train, the better. Mike says, Mike Rowe, who has been on the show twice. I'm wishing more did. Andrew, Andrew's been on the show. First initial thought is that I could see problems with a shift in power between employees and management. Mm, good point. If I'm a senior manager and a yellow belt and one of my newest hires is the black belt teacher, I could see that as a problem. If I'm the senior manager and the black belt, not so much of an issue. If I'm the senior manager and the company hires someone else to come and teach, it's fine until new hires start grossly progressing faster than the senior managers. It's an important concept. And this illustrates one of my fundamental beliefs that it's very difficult to maintain multiple distinct relationships with another person. This is why it's really hard to work with a spouse. This is why it can be really sensitive for a martial arts instructor to socialize with students outside of, outside of training. It's why as a general rule, a general rule, instructors dating their students is a terrible idea there's a power dynamic, right? And a healthy relationship has parity. Matt responds, I like the idea, but I agree with Andrew. I don't feel it would go over well. Gabe says, yeah, I can definitely see where issues would arise. One of my first jobs, I worked with a couple of guys who trained together and it was interesting because the manager was a lower rank than his employees. So their roles were reversed in training. They had a good relationship and were friends. So there were never any issues at work. Lessie says, I think we've all had at least one boss that we wanted to punch at some point or another. Ironically, the only boss I've actually punched is the one that I like. Is one, excuse me, one that I like. Michael Sartwell. Sean, Michael Sartwell. He's been on the show. I've never actually sparred with Jeremy. That's me. We should fix that sometime once all this craziness is over. Lessie, uh, if the name doesn't ring a bell to you guys, she is one of the driving forces behind Martial Arts Radio. It's good to have the martial arts audience that understands what I mean by, I want to punch you sometime, said as a friendly gesture. Totally. I understand. I agree. I think the cleanest way to do it involves someone who is not an employee doing the instruction. Now, let's suppose that you've got an employee who is really skilled and they would be perfectly qualified. Find another company and you guys swap because again, that multiple distinct relationship thing, assuming that you like your job, assuming that you don't want to be fired from your job, it's important. It's important to respect and maintain that balance of power where appropriate. Lessie is awesome. Yes, she is. <laughs> Andrew says, be careful, Jeremy. She has reach on you. Andrew, everyone has reach on me. I'm five foot seven when I stretch and st sit up really tall. But as I've told plenty of people, if you spar me, you got to spar me like I'm six foot. I have a very, I have very flexible hips. I can, my hips disjoint like a snake's jaw. I will kick you from far further away than you would ever imagine possible. Hmm. 
This is a good question. For tournaments, I have my pump up jams, but if your martial arts journey had a theme song, what would it be? Oh, see, I'm torn between giving some kind of positive inspirational answer and something horribly self-deprecating. Uh, so I'm going to think about that. Oh, no, we don't have any other answers. So I, I, I got to I got to be the one here as all of you in the chat come up with something. Um, hmm. A theme song. I mean, I could be I could be cheesy and say something like don't stop believing by literally journey. Uh, I could. Oh. See, this, this is the challenge of thinking on the spot. It doesn't always come out well. Somebody in the chat save me. Okay. Paul says ACDC's TNT. Okay. Okay. Gabe's typing his out. His would be... Now we are free from the movie Gladiator. Okay. All right. I don't know. I'm going to have to think on that one. I got nothing. And here's why. Here's why. Because I'm thinking about describing my martial arts journey. And it has been long and varied and encompassed so much. I started when I was four. There's not To talk about my martial arts journey is to talk about my life. There's not a lot of life that doesn't relate to martial arts. There's not a lot of life that is separate from martial arts. The things that I do that aren't martial arts related still come from a martial arts mindset. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's an excuse. Maybe I'm being lame with my answer, but that's all I got. Andrew says right now it's one is the lonely number. <laughs> Yes, I think I think we could all agree to that as an anthem. When you tell a non-martial artist what you do, what word do you use? For example, I do karate or I practice kung fu. This has come up a couple times on the show, and I, I wish I remembered who said this. That we had a guest who really made the case that the word play was the right verb. And while it doesn't hit my ear right, I agree. And here's why. When we say play in English, we can use that word in a number of different ways. If we're talking about playing with blocks as a small child, that's not what I mean. Gabe says, I think it was someone who was in Capoeira. And you know what? I don't think it was. Play is generally the verb ascribed to capoeira, but this was someone else because what's what's what I'm remembering is that they had to make a strong case for it. Now maybe I'm wrong because you know what did we have yesterday? Episode five twenty two. We've been talking to a lot of people. I've been talking to a lot of people. Um, I don't always remember. But if you use the word play a little bit differently, if we're thinking about play in terms of let's say basketball. LeBron James plays basketball. Hey, it's a cat. You want to come on camera? What do you think? Nope, not at all. LeBron James plays basketball, but he plays basketball very differently than I play basketball. If I play basketball, I'm just hanging out, having fun, shooting hoops. He's literally trying to do his job. He is playing, hopefully enjoying himself, but he's taking it very seriously, making a lot of money. And I'm not specifically saying that it's basketball. You could find the same thing in professional sports across the world. Pro football, pro soccer, pro baseball. Play is a good word because the best participants, the best athletes enjoy what they're doing. They have fun, but they also invest enough of themselves that they're getting better, they're moving things forward, they're uh, generating results for the people around them. And I think you can say the same thing about martial arts. Andrew says, I do martial arts. Matt says, I teach karate slash martial arts. I tend to say teach more than train or do. Laura says, I break slash kick stuff. 
even if you're not willing to use the word play when you describe what you do, I would like to suggest that you think about it from that perspective. If someone can't watch you, at least from time to time, participating in martial arts and say that you're having fun, that you are being playful, then you're probably taking it too seriously. So. All right. <laughs> this is a great meme. I don't know, kick thing. My face when someone asks, what do you do for fun? Um, I don't know, kick things. And that's pretty descriptive of a lot. A lot of us is certainly descriptive of me. Uh, kicking things is pretty therapeutic. It's something that I do for fun. It's something I do when I'm frustrated. It's something I do when um, there is minor demolition to be done and I have the opportunity. Oh, we got Nathan in the chat. Oh, that's interesting. Jason says our Japanese exchange students would say that they play karate. Oh, okay. I like it. I like it. So this is where words can have multiple definitions. And I think it's important to recognize that, that, that there's a nuance to language and we shouldn't get wrapped around the axle on it. I could say I play martial arts and I could mean that in a rather serious way. And if you hear me say, I play martial arts, you don't necessarily need to assume that I mean something to, you know, here's a better example. If someone says, oh, I heard you play karate. If I had heard that even just a couple years ago, I would have assumed that was disrespectful. It doesn't have to be. Mike says, I always say I study martial arts. Study, train, play, do, teach, learn, practice. I think it's probably my second favorite word is practice. Because what does a medical professional do? They practice. They're a practicing doctor. They're a practicing dentist. They're continuing to learn. There's so much to learn. And I think that's a really valuable uh, approach. All right. If you could be any fictional martial arts character, who would you choose? Hmm. It's wide open. I think I'm going with one of the Ninja, Ninja Turtles. No, that would not be a good life. I wouldn't want to live in a sewer. Who had it made? trying to think who who really who who had the best life with that Craig is saying master Ugwe he's very wise formidable warrior and makes me laugh um I've heard that name and I'm trying to place it so I'm gonna need some help people in the chat Craig if you're still in here um well Gabe's helping me Kung Fu Panda. Okay, yes, that's why I've heard that. Yes, I'll uh, I'll agree with I'll agree with that one. That one's pretty good. Hmm. See, here's the thing. Everybody I'm thinking of, I don't want to be them, because they get beat up and shot and stabbed and thrown off things, and and it's tragic, and I don't want to volunteer to be tragic. Any other thoughts? Tommy says Poe. You know, the more I'm thinking about this, the more I realize martial arts characters in, in movies and, and TV, really it, the, the whole construct is set up so they suffer because that's what creates conflict. But let's be real. Who's going to watch a movie about somebody where everything's going great? People don't like that. We need to see some, we need to see some growth, some conflict, some overcoming. Yeah, you can put that one up. 
Chuck Norris built the hospital that he was born in. <laughs> I like that. I like that. You know, I love that Chuck Norris jokes keep going. I am fearfully looking forward to what people will say about him when he passes. He's an older gentleman. And he's Chuck Norris. And he's in great shape and, and everything. We know that. But these jokes are funny because he was okay with them. Not originally, but he's okay with them now. I hope they'll continue. I hope people will continue to make Chuck Norris jokes. I hope we will remember him in that way because there's a whole generation of martial artists who are probably not going to watch his movies. They're not going to see his TV show. Um, there's a whole, there, there is a group of people who in 10 or 20 years, when you say Walker, Texas Ranger, will think of Jared Padalecki because that's who they've cast to, to in the reboot and not Chuck Norris. True story, Chuck Norris actually survived two heart attacks in the same day last year. I didn't know that. I'm unsurprised. He's a rugged man. He's a good guy. Um, and my entire opinion of Chuck Norris comes from Bill Wallace and, and what he had to say. So, um, If Bill thinks you're a good guy, I think you're a good guy. Anyone have experience in team forms or team fighting? Uh, team forms to me means synchronized forms. Team fighting, um, I'm used to the rules on that being total accumulated points, but I, I've heard of other sets, uh, other rule sets with that. Um, Matt says, I've made interactive team forms with up to four people in them, never demoed it, but had a two person three nunchuck form where we would switch past the third chuck around to each other. Oh, that sounds really cool. I would love to see video of that. I just wait. Well, I mean, I wish competitions existed, uh, not virtually. And I hope that when we get to have them in person again, I hope that people will, uh, I hope that people will consider having different events. I, I think having, at least one kind of different, fun, creative event, even if not everybody's doing it at an event. Uh, I, I think that's, I think it's important. Tommy's done both. Cool. Tommy, post some of your, uh, your thoughts in the chat, please, and I'll read them. All right, Gabe, what we got going on here? <laughs> Is that what you're showing first? We're showing Grumpy Cat. Didn't Grumpy Cat just die? I think Grumpy Cat died. Your instructor is making this face. What just happened and what is he or she saying? Um, I have gotten that face many, many times from probably every instructor I've ever had. And, and it's not limited to when I was younger. I am... I am prone to cracking jokes in class. I, I am most of the time good at knowing when it is not appropriate. Okay. Once in a while, I'll push that line. But being generally a higher rank, and generally having the favor of the instructor, I get away with some stuff. Once in a while, I'll make a joke and I'll get that face. <laughs> As a kid, I got that face for everything. Craig says, so Craig, when you said you remembered the former really well, you meant you didn't really remember it the correct way. I remembered it just with some self-imposed modifications. Laura says, I get that face when I walk in the door. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Hmm. Do 
Jason says, yes, and one night our entire class had gas. Our instructor got fed up really quickly. <laughs> you ever teach a kid's class where it's like everybody had burritos for six days before coming in? Oh, you can't get anything done because if there's one demographic that thinks farts are funny, it's young children. And all it takes is one of them laughing. And then the moment you get a, a second emission, all bets are off. Gabe says, Jenny has just snapped around into a fighting stance, threatening me with her potent sidekick after I tickled her from behind. And she's saying, hey, now. <laughs> These are some of the complications when you are married to your instructor. What's the strangest place you've ever done a form? Let's see. I have done forms not on a train, on a plane, not on a bus, maybe on a bus. I've done them in bathrooms. I've done them in gymnasiums. I've done them outside in rivers, lakes, parking lots, in the woods. I really, I'm trying to think, I'm sure I have. I just don't remember when. I hope some of you all have. Laura says, cruise ship. Oh, cool. I don't know that I've done one on a cruise ship. I've been on a cruise ship a couple times. Hmm. Matt says, my desk, when in high school, outside of a friendly's restaurant, retirement home, courthouse. Probably have more strange ones not coming to mind. Gabe says, I did a kata in Disneyland once. Oh, that's cool. Leslie says, outside the Eiffel Tower, Tokyo Tower, on top of a mountain in Switzerland, Dublin Castle. So far, Leslie wins by a mile. Andrew says, I don't know it's incredibly strange, but my wife and I were on vacation at a resort in Jamaica. I told all the students in the dojo that I would still be practicing every day. I ended up recording a different kata every day from someplace in the resort and posting them on Facebook. It was pretty neat to do, and occasionally a guest would ask what I was doing. The neatest was on a wall inside of a pool. The wall was one to two inches below the surface and was about eight inches wide. I did... You re... Everybody's got different names. Uh, I did Nafanshi Shodan, a.k.a. Teki Shodan, a.k.a. Nahanshin, a.k.a. I don't remember the Taekwondo name for it. Unfortunately, video quality was too low to share here. Bummer. Uh, Jason, that would have to be during a parade for me. The parade kept stopping, so I had the kids start doing forms. Oh, I did. I was dressed as a Ninja Turtle. I was Raphael, of course. And we were all doing Pinyon Shodan on the back of a float. Uh... Tried to get through Chunji underwater, says Paul. Didn't work too well. Uh, Laura said the cruise ship, it didn't work too well with the waves. Yeah, I think Leslie wins by a mile. What's the most valuable martial arts advice you've ever been given? have fun. I know it sounds simplistic and it's easy to dismiss because it just sounds like a very cavalier thing to say, oh, just have fun. No, genuinely, have fun. If you have fun, other things will happen. If you do not have fun, nothing else will happen. How easy it is, is it to stick with something for years, decades, the rest of your life and invest time and money and sweat and blood and whatever if it's not fun, you've got to find a way to make it fun. Anybody who's taught knows if you don't make it fun, they don't stick around and they don't learn anything. Tommy says, give a, uh, sorry, Tommy says, get up. Jason says, serious advice, use my martial arts to help to heal people, not hurt people. Mm. Matt says, Mushim and Choshim, empty mind and beginner's mind, are keys in mastering yourself. So you, in return, can help the next person master themselves. Being able to pass it on, I think, is pretty great, pretty important. 
this of course doesn't just apply to BJJ, it applies anywhere. And I've had to do this to people. I've had to do this to people in seminars. Hey, I'm paying attention. You don't have to pay attention, but stop distracting me with your not paying attention. You can wait a few minutes. The show's almost done. Would you like to say hi to everyone? Come here. Brr, come here, cat. Brr, come here. If you watch First Cup, which is uh, weekdays at 6.30 a.m. Eastern on YouTube, you get to see Zuza once in a while because she usually sits with me on the couch. You can see she's being a very grumpy cat right now. Here you go. She's probably looking for more food. I will feed you in like four minutes. What's the worst martial arts advice you've ever been given? Oh. I'm going to read other people's while I think about that. Do we have feedback from people? Yes. Matt says, do the technique like this which was different from how I normally would do the same technique. So I asked what the application would be since I'm doing it differently because it's how I said to do it. Teaching applications to techniques under fourth degree black belt is bad. Block is block. Double block is only block to, is only block to opponent. Students need not know more than that. I had a huge issue with that. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've had the, you know, because I said so, I, which usually is covering for people not knowing things. What else have I heard? I've heard, I've heard people talk about stretching, various methods of helping people stretch or, or ways to get more flexible that are just not going to be healthy over time. You know, we've had that 22 push-up challenge going around among a lot of martial artists and I've sent some videos because people are doing their push-ups like this which you know what if you really want rotator cuff surgery that's great index fingers out keep your elbows closer to your body is it a little bit harder yeah but it puts the load on the shoulder which is where it's supposed to be and the, and the pec someone once told me only do what's easy for you Ooh. Ooh. I can make a case for that in certain circumstances, but not, not as an overall training philosophy. Gabe typed that one in. And we'll probably end on this one. What do you think of Joe Rogan's comparison of video games to martial arts? Uh, do we have what he said? Because I'm unfamiliar. Uh... And video games are a real problem. You know why? Because they're fun. I have a real problem with them. They're real exciting, but you just don't get anywhere. You could learn jiu-jitsu, and then three years later, you're an elite jiu-jitsu athlete. Or you could just be playing video games. Three years later, you could be that same kid playing video games. Huh. We're going to skip that one. Let's go to the next thing. I don't want to end on that. I don't have enough. You know what, Sa Gabe, let's save that for next time. Uh, let's do before you do. Yeah. What are your thoughts on skipping ranks or testing for multiple ranks at once? Ah, it has a place. It is, it should be rare. Um, when I trained in Shotokan because I had a fair amount of time in, I already had a black belt. Uh, I skipped some ranks. I started as a white belt and I think I went from white to blue to brown over the course of a couple years. I still had to know all the forms. I still had to know all the techniques. I was given some, essentially some credit for time in, uh, but I, my standard, I was held to all the same standards. I thought that that was an okay way to do it. What I don't like is, and, and if you listen to the show, you know, I'm not a big fan of just going from black belt to black belt and getting grandfathered in. Andrew says, I think it's okay. Obviously, each school will be different. Perhaps someone came in with previous experience, which made learning things much quicker for them. Or maybe they just have a natural aptitude for it and pick it up quickly. 
At the lower ranks, I've seen it done and haven't had much issue with it. However, I've never seen it done for higher ranks above 4th Q. Matt says, I'm not a fan. I don't mind letting someone test early, but not skipping ranks altogether. To touch on what Andrew said, if someone comes in with previous experience, depending on how long ago it was, I just honor rank or do a one-on-one -on -one lesson to see what they know to determine if they should start over or not. Where this becomes really relevant is, is kind of a couple cases. One, if people are paying for their promotions, and I mean like significantly, or if uh, testings only occur at time intervals. If you have somebody come in and they've got prior experience and, you know, they, they show up for four classes and, you know, they were a black belt before and you test them for yellow belt, bam. And then, you know, two months later, you test them for blue belt because they know all this stuff, bam. There's nothing inhibiting their progress. And I think that that's the key. What is best for the student? Are they able to progress? Are they moving forward? You're good to go there. And it looks like pretty much everybody in the chat says some of the same things. Although one, Jason answered the worst advice comment. What was the worst martial arts advice you've ever had? And uh, you should only learn martial arts from Asian people. <laughs> that is horrible. It's so horrible. It's, just, it's not even a good thing to think. You know what? Maybe there was a time when that would have been good advice but we are long past that. And um, for those of you, of course, if you've been around a while, you know that Gabe helps with this show and has done a phenomenal job over the course of a year. We're knocking on a year, man. We've been doing this. And tomorrow uh, is a special day for someone very special in his life. So I uh, want to give a shout out to Jenny. Happy birthday, Jenny. Uh, Jenny, of course, uh, is, uh, you know what? I'm not going to talk much about that yet. Jenny's working on some stuff too. She's doing a killer job on a project in the background. And I am super excited to start seeing that come forward because here's a hint. Any of you with martial arts schools teaching children, especially those of you looking for material for your Zoom classes, you're going to love what she's working on. Great stuff great stuff so well there we go there's another there's another installment of whistlekick live thank you for joining us thank you to everyone in the chat had a lot of fun i appreciate your time i appreciate your comments your humor i appreciate your support a uh, huge super duper shout out to gabe as always for all the work that he puts in on this i could not I, I could do it without him, but it would suck a lot it would not be nearly as much fun for me or any of you so uh, that's pretty valuable. Um, what else? We've got First Cup coming live to you in like eight hours. So if you want to check that out tomorrow morning on YouTube, do so. Of course, Martial Arts Radio, Mondays and Thursdays in your podcast feed. And don't forget the apparel, the programs, the little bit of gear that we have left. Yes, uh, it's, all, it's all there. Go to whistlekick.com. And that's that. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for your time, your support. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.